Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here today. And I actually think I may, uh, what I'm presenting may be the saddest example <laughs> of the, of the um, concept of scale and spread. Um, and so I will just give just enough information so you know what we're talking about. And then I think I'll talk about the good parts and the bad parts and do that all in under five minutes. And we can, in the Q&A, if I'm still able to be here, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it. So the Truth Campaign was a national, and I'm actually focusing on the truth as opposed to X for purposes of this talk. The Truth Campaign was a public education campaign uh, that was a primary prevention campaign to help young people not take up the behavior of tobacco use that was piloted first or put up in a large scale first in the state of Florida um, when there was a separate settlement with the, with the Attorney General there outside of the 46 state settlement that happened with tobacco. Um, and it was highly successful. And um, about the time that the data came in on just how successful, a 40% decline in smoking among middle school, a 20% decline among high school, no uh, change in the two contiguous states to that state, um, legacy was being created and being funded out of the master settlement agreement. And um, so we basically took that campaign, which was in fact developed at Columbia University under a contract with the CDC with a group of uh, national youth marketing experts that suggested that the approach to fight against tobacco use among adolescents was um, this type of a model, create a brand more compelling that their, than their brand, which is an extraordinarily um, challenging thing to do. Um, that campaign met and exceeded that challenge. Um, the Truth Campaign had a rational component and an emotional component, and essentially it took the need states of adolescence that tobacco met and met them instead uh, with a pushback against big tobacco. It was exceedingly anti-tobacco industry, as I think some campaigns against other corporate um, bad deed doers might need to be to get this kind of effect, and there's the sad story in this lesson. When you go up against big business in America, uh, there is fallout, and there is not an enormous amount of um, uptake and um, copycatting. Uh, so the the result of the campaign was, you know, it it didn't preach at kids, it did not condemn smokers, but it did condemn the tobacco industry, and they didn't appreciate it. They sued us. We were in litigation for years. We ultimately won, which was good. Um, the underlying philosophy of the campaign was that sensation seekers are much more likely to smoke. If you see these bars, if you're, if you're high on the sensation seeking scale as an adolescent, you're much more likely um, to be open to smoking, to ultimately become a smoker, and to stay a smoker. So that was the sweet spot of a very large public education media buy, the second largest amount of money ever spent by a nonprofit in the history of the U.S. in the media space, the first being um, the Partnership for Drug-Free America because it was on the air for years and years and years. The impact of the campaign, and I didn't print these out, but put a slide on these, but I will tell you, was that there was a, ma a very significant decline, a doubling in the rate of decline of youth smoking in the U.S., and it, within that doubling of that decline, 25 percent of that was attributable, 22 percent was clearly attributable to the Truth Campaign, probably more, but a conservative estimate was 22 percent. It translated into 300,000 young people not starting to smoke in the first two years, 450,000 at the end of uh, the first four years. It made it a very unpopular program with the tobacco industry for obvious reasons. Um, but was it picked up by all of the states who said, yes, we want to heavy up the truth campaign in our state? No, it was not. And in fact, we, in we attempted to incentivize states to, to bring the campaign to a higher level within their states, and we had virtually no takers. And the reason we had virtually no takers not, was not because it wasn't working, but was because of the politics of the campaign. Um, the, it, it was successful in the sense that in a very short period of time, 75% of all youth could not, not only knew the campaign, 90% of the, of the adolescents in the United States knew the campaign, 75% could actually describe an ad. So in terms of spread, the campaign spread like wildfire. It was exceedingly, it had had probably the highest measured ever did you talk about the campaign to a friend level for any ad campaign for-profit or not-for-profit. It, it varied between 22% and 40% depending on the ad. So imagine, you know, being Chrysler and putting an ad on the air at that 40% of people were talking to their friends about it. It's, it's an unusual metric. It's usually down around 5% to give you a sense in, or less. Um, so the conceptual model for the campaign, and this is the new conceptual model, this campaign is now back again, um, legacy of 
you know, at the time that I departed, we were going through a year-long process of did we want to dig into our corpus to bring this campaign back, even though we did not have the money in real time to spend at the level one needs to spend, and the decision was made to go ahead and do that. So they are out now again, and they are trying to rep replicate um, the kinds of results that they had initially, and I think they'll they'll do an excellent job in in doing so. It's a different type of campaign. It's called Finish It. Um, again, it is it is different than the campaign of the year 2000, which was totally TV and radio dependent at a time when 90 percent of adolescents said that's where they got their information. This is now a campaign that looks a little bit like the Arab Spring. There's a TV component. It's big, but the idea is to try to spark a lot of online activity, friending, Facebooking, Twitter, Twitter, blah, 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 to really grow the campaign organically. That is a huge challenge. And the reason it's a huge challenge, no matter what your issue is, whether it's this, whether it's food, whether it's you know, breast cancer, you name it, especially with adolescents, you're competing for their attention with a very, very broad range of issues, concerns, and engagements. And so the result is that it's a, a big challenge. So in the, at the end, I would just simply say that um, th from my perspective, the, the challenge we have is particularly for illnesses that we're trying to combat, behaviors that we're combating, where there's a corporate interest. And that is true for big food, which I like to now call not food. That's my acronym. For, so big food, not food, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. Take those four. If you really do a campaign like this one that has the capacity to drop the use, and as part of that campaign, um, you position the industry probably exactly where it belongs in terms of the impact it's having on human health, um, you will not bring a broad, you, it's harder to bring a lot of people along. And you, you then become, in a sense, a lone ranger. So one way of thinking of the truth campaign is to think of it as a, it was a lone ranger campaign. It was so lone, lone ranger that when I became this, the, the initial CEO and the ads were, shall we say, in the can but hadn't really been disclosed yet to anyone, I said, aren't we, how are we bringing our partners along? And they said, we can't bring our partners along because we can't let anybody see the ads. And I said, well, that's crazy. I mean, let's show our partners the ads. And they said, take our word for it. You don't want to show these ads to anyone. So I said, OK, I'm new. Let's not show them to anyone. Well, as it turns out, the network had already shown them to anyone, and anyone was Philip Morris. So in fact, that was good advice. I was used to working on health problems where you didn't have a well-defined, well-heeled, well-organized, and committed enemy. And when you do have that, I think it reframes the situation. And frankly, I think our, our issues with the obesity epidemic, um, while we're getting some improvement, no question, and I'm sure much of it related to RWJ's efforts, uh, we have a huge problem that we're facing, and we have a corporate problem set of players. And it'll be very interesting to see how we can move the needle in that environment. So everything from now after me will be upbeat.